What's up guys, Saf here on Super Saf Speaks and welcome to episode number 13 of the podcast with myself, your host, Saf. And your co-host, Thunder E from Border Work. And uh, we thought it's going to be a quiet week this week and with not much going on, but that all changed because we've had quite a few things pop up. YouTube may potentially remove the dislike button. I've got lots of thoughts about this, so we'll discuss that. WWDC has uh, officially been announced, so let's look at what we can expect, what hints there might be. Xiaomi has been releasing devices left, right, center, but the two biggest uh, ones this week that they've uh, talked about, we've got the Xiaomi um, Mi 11 Ultra, as well as the Xiaomi Mi Mix Fold, Xiaomi's first foldable device. PayPal is going to be allowing uh, Bitcoin and crypto spending. So that's uh, something I know E likes to talk about crypto a lot. And then uh, we've got some more potential bad news for LG. Uh, LG might discontinue software support for existing phones after exiting the market. So that's the latest news that we have there. Okay, so we've got a few things here. E, um, I want to talk yeah. about YouTube first because I've got I've got a lot of thoughts about this and a lot of uh, opinions <laughs> about uh, this whole dislike button thing. So uh, yesterday, uh, YouTube tweeted uh, this. It was uh, in response to creator feedback around well-being and targeted dislike campaigns. We're testing a few new designs that don't show the public discount uh, dislike count. If you're part of this small experiment, you might spot one of these designs in the coming weeks. Okay, so. There's a couple of things here. So they've they've mentioned creator well-being because you know this is something you see dislikes likes. We've seen Instagram kind of run this test where they've removed the total number of likes that you can see on posts to make it yeah. less about the whole like experience. But YouTube has I'd say been one of the only platforms that's had a dislike button so you can actually see what uh the ratio is because whether we look at Facebook, whether we look at Twitter, uh, Instagram we mentioned right now, TikTok, there's only likes. You can only see the positivity. You can't see any of that negativity, right? So there's that element. But then the key thing here, which I think nobody's really touching on uh, because I saw a few of the YouTubers cover this, but nobody's really touching it on, is mm -hmm. targeted dislike campaigns, right? Now, this is something that we have uh, seen uh, e, I'm not going to mention the name of the creator because I, you know, we've not uh, asked for permission. But there was a creator that we know um, who was targeted by dislike bots. So we don't know who it was. It was maybe somebody who didn't like uh, this person, or maybe I don't know. We, we we just don't know who it was. But essentially, when this creator would ever upload a video onto YouTube immediately within um you know minutes they'd get thousands of dislikes right yeah in about now, 10 minutes max well yeah with, within 10 minutes you'd get thousands of dislikes now this completely destroys the video because um a, 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 a viewer comes onto a video they see that it's got thousands of dislikes only a few hundred likes they think maybe it's a clickbait video maybe it's a, a, a video that's irrelevant and they won't watch it and then they switch off. Now, I wanna emphasize here that when it comes to situations situations like this, YouTube are absolutely useless, right? Individual situations like this, they will not do absolutely anything. <laughs> they are completely and utterly useless. So I wanna make a point of this because, um, you know, I've had situations as well where I've kind of contacted them uh, for something and they will not do anything about this, right? So when it comes to individual situations like this, it's impossible to actually do something as a creator. Now you can disable the likes and dislikes, but that actually makes, you know, e, if you go onto a video that has likes and dislikes disabled, what does that tell you? Like that tells you that, why have they switched it off? Maybe they- Yeah, they can't dislikes. handle that's the right. heat, yeah. Exactly, so again, that's negative. Now, the other, the other element that I also wanna mention is that if you go onto Google right now and you search for buy dislikes YouTube, you get hundreds, if not thousands of results, how to easily buy dislikes or likes for a video, right? This exists yeah. on Google's, YouTube's own bloody platform. It's so easy to actually go and do this. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, but it's not rocket science to, uh, you know, remove these search results, which are obviously malicious, right? Um, but they don't do this, right? So now obviously they're trying to do something, but there's been a big, big backlash from uh, a lot of creators saying, 
no, this actually helps a lot to see if a video is actually good or not, right? And by removing this, you're actually taking away from this element. So now obviously it's still a test, it's not black and white, but this is what's kind of going on. So obviously I've, I've spat out a lot of, uh, I've, I've gone on off on a bit of a rant on here. E, what are your thoughts on this so far? You know, the first thing I'll say is kudos for YouTube for sharing this out there. You know, we've always talked about them trying to do more stuff on the platform. And here's something that I'm going to touch on really quick before I continue is that they had to share this information on Twitter. They couldn't share it on their own platform. Something mm -hmm. is wrong there. Just, just, just put it that way. It is something is wrong there because I didn't know about this until you sent me the tweet. And I wouldn't have known it unless he was put on Twitter. So that's beside the point. Um, one thing, though, I will say, though, is like when I saw that, and I was like, I was, for me personally, I was like, cool. The reason mm. why is that um, a clubhouse, one of the YouTube guys who had joined one of our rooms says, for the algorithm itself, likes and discount likes do not even factor in that much he doesn't say he doesn't factor at all but i said like don't you shouldn't worry it's not about a priority that. watch time obviously and things like that also yeah a priority but like you said human nature causes it to be a priority because once you see the amount of dislikes then you go i'm not watching that video or you might even add to the dislikes subconsciously just because you're already going with the bias into the video you crowd, know? crowd mentality exactly so so I can see why they're thinking, you know what, let's just hide it. It's still, that data will still come in, in, in a sense, but it's not going to even actually function to the video, so it really doesn't matter. To me, you know, there is no happy balance here because the parent company, Google, will not stop the ability to buy, at least look for the platforms to buy dislikes because the mentality there is for a business, you must allow people to buy likes and must allow people to buy dislikes. Like you must have- No, no, I mean, that's, if, so So likes and dislikes are a form of organic engagement. As soon as you buy these, it's it's not, it's, it's, it's I would I, I, I can't use the term word illegal, but it goes against the terms of YouTube, right? Buy, yeah, I mean, cause, I cause, mean, cause it's not actual engagement. Yeah, yeah, it goes in terms of YouTube, does, has nothing to do with Google. Yeah, but Google is is part of YouTube, that, right? That doesn't, so if doesn't there's, matter. If, if there's something that's illegal or if there's something that's malicious, right? I mean, it's not rocket science to kind of take that off. So I, I want to say this. Okay, so I, I appreciate Google's doing something about it, finally, many years later, right? Because we've seen many of these situations happen in the past. Um, I've yeah. even seen brands who have uploaded something and then a competitor brand has actually gone out and bought <laughs> dislike bots to kind of bring that uh, video down, right? So I've yeah, seen many instances yeah. of it. So I'm, I'm glad YouTube are finally doing something. But here's my issue with YouTube, right? Their solution to problems seems to be all right, we'll just cancel it, right? So for instance, when there was issues with uh, inappropriate comments, instead of trying to figure out a solution, they were just like, we're gonna disable comments on these videos, which feature yeah. um, children just completely. So it's just like, the solution seems to be like, okay, uh, you know, like, okay, so there's a there's a shop that sells um, uh, knives, right? And then, you know, there's, there's an incident that happens to like, okay, we're gonna stop selling knives instead of <laughs> having security checks before you sell the knife. You know what I mean? I, I know that's just not the best analogy, but uh, yeah, you, I, get, you get my point, right? I, I, no, so I, I do, I do. So, so I mean, like from the way I say it, I don't know the exact solution, but I would say number one, YouTube, you are part of Google. Google really needs to crack down on these because most people, if they are doing this, they're gonna be going through Google as a search engine to find this. It's so easy to find this. It's so easy to do this. They can do that. If you cut them off at that source where if you're searching for something like this, you do not get any relevant search results, right? Cut. That's one thing and that's then, gone And there. then they have to just go to Bing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, nobody's going to do that. Let's be honest. <laughs> wow. No, no offense to pick. Anyway, but the other thing as well, a few people are mentioning is maybe kind of, you know, you've got this algorithm maybe kind of see if you see any malicious activity maybe you see a bunch of dislikes coming from a particular area which doesn't seem right maybe you're seeing people disliking a video before even watching a, a few I mean, seconds I, of it i i i mean There's a balance that's there. that's that's the answer there the answer is very simple you create an algorithm that looks and its job is to look at malicious attacks on channels. So basically, if a channel has 5,000 views and then it has 3,000 dislikes, is that possible at that rate? Because normally that rate will only go if the video is hitting 1 million views within a short period of time. 
then you know, okay, there is a balance between dislikes and likes because that creator also has mm. 10 million followers. Okay, you know, there's always a, there's a mathematical balance to it. And yeah. it's basically creating an algorithm that is built to tackle that and then using that as a case study, an example to say, okay, has it done its job? Has it done its job? It's not enforcing. It's just letting you know where things are because then you can either humanly enforce or then you can actually automatically enforce after you've done that as opposed to just saying, mm, let's just take it out. You make yeah. algorithms for a living. You might as well do it. <laughs> exactly. I mean, yeah, so as I said, I I'm glad that they're addressing this issue. I think that something needs to be done for sure about it. I don't think this is the solution. Um, obviously, it's still, an, it's, it's still a test. It's not like they've taken it away straight away. And I think following the feedback, they probably won't take it out. But my sort of message and conclusion to this would be YouTube, look into this find a solution that's better than just switching it off because that's your solution for everything <laughs> most likely you know like what we've seen find a solution not just uh uh okay done cut it off yeah again i'm i'm not being paid to come up with the solution for you but we've already given a few suggestions uh but yeah i mean it would be a shame to see dislikes go because you know i've been on to uh um videos which have been complete clickbait right a misleading title and thumbnail so dislike actually gives you a way of kind of um, showing that frustration, right? And mm -hmm. uh, also helps with this. So yeah, it's it's a useful feature, 100%, but it has been misused a lot in the past. And, you know, that's that's something that definitely needs to be addressed. Yeah, exactly. Like my Xbox Series uh, S video. So many dislikes for no reason. I wonder, <laughs> no I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder. I wonder. Okay, so uh, next up, uh, we have uh, WWDC. 2021 so the invites have gone out it will be taking place this year fully virtually like it was last year june 7th to june 11th now we've got this uh memoji graphic which is uh, in you know uh referencing uh craig's uh meme that was from the m1 uh macbooks launch event that kind of became a beam so it's 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 uh, very much in that format and uh, the caption is glow and behold. Now we've already heard lots of rumors about what's gonna be included. We're expecting generally updates to iOS, so iOS 15, iPad OS 15, Mac OS 12, watch OS updates, etc. Potentially new iPads and AirTags as well, something that's been talked about quite a bit. But I wanna kind of break down this, uh, this uh, invite, right? So there's a couple of things. So for me, the first thing that stands out is because it's a reference to Craig's uh, uh, meme that became of him kind of opening the MacBook, right? That would mm -hmm. firstly hint to me that we will potentially be hearing about, if not, we're going to be seeing the new M1 um, devices, or at least we're going to be hearing about maybe the M1X or the M2, whatever it's called, the next generation M, yeah. uh, the next generation Apple Silicon. Would you agree? I, I would agree. I, I think uh, it's it's going to be less about the silicon and more about the new MacBook, uh, okay. um, in the sense that I believe the M1X, because it's a bump upgrade in the sense that they're just adding more cores. There's nothing new in the design or anything like that. It's really going to focus more on that new MacBook and how the design, the power, everything flows through. You know, mm -hmm. giving you that whole like uh, feel to it. Um, I also. You know, just looking at it, you can see some of the icons from uh, iOS on her glasses. So you're looking to see also with the new iPad as well, like what are those changes that will come with that, um, with it. So, yep. I mean, you know, I don't know much of these stuff with, with Apple. Yeah, <laughs> Apple events. I know you don't. I, I'm new, but, I'm new but to the land there. What's, what's interesting is every invite that's gone out and every memo, uh, memoji or memoji, whatever you call, I, I, I still can't. I can't remember what it's Memoji. Called. Memoji or is Memoji, right? Um, they all have glasses, okay? Yeah. And it's interesting because um, <laughs> my friend Khalifa uh, from uh, uh, Mr. Q, Rock Me TV, he was just like, um, I'm, I'm looking into the reflection of the glasses like everybody looks at Saf's sunglasses to see what he's using. <laughs> mm -hmm. But does that, the fact that they've all got glasses on, does that potentially hint that we're going to be seeing Apple glasses. No, no. AR glasses. Not, not, or if not anytime soon. I mean, there's, there's rumors that it's going to be closer and things like that. There's a rumor I just saw that said towards the end of the year there'll be an in-person event to showcase this. 
Um, because with the AR glasses, you definitely need an in-person event. Uh, and I think if they cannot do it at the end of the year, they will push it till next year. Just because, okay. you know. It, but maybe, again, maybe you, they'll hint it. Yeah, I mean, they may, you, they may, they may. I don't think they will. I don't think they need to hint it because if you think about it from this perspective, here's the other thing with those icon packs for iOS. They're going to, to me, I think they're going to talk more about iOS apps more on the Mac as well because of Apple Silicon, because of some new software things they've done where it's much easier to bring your apps over. So whatever apps you use, you know, now it's like a set number of apps. I think by WWDC, they will say, hey, look, if you just, you know, uh, developers, if you do this, your app will be there in 10 seconds, you know, and mm. boom, done. So Let's see. Let's I, I think, see. I think that's, that's going to play into it as, as well. I don't think we're going to see the glasses just because they really want to make that, you know, pop out. Like, you know, they deal. really want that. It's a, it's going to be a big deal, especially you weren't around. Uh, we had a um, uh, Twitter Spaces room with Mark uh, Robles. He's an old tech head, um, was myself, Viper, uh, Renee, and he, you know, he jumped on and he started talking about uh, some of the Apple employees he lives close by and he tests a lot of Apple stuff. He's like, I can't tell you what it is, but I test a lot of stuff mm -hmm. on a regular basis. And he talked about the uh, AirPods Max they use, the, the nine microphones and how they use the microphones to select, uh, pinpoint where sound is actually coming from. And he said, you know, he knows there's some patterns to, to how that will be used in the next uh, Apple TV. And he's thinking that will actually play a bigger role with AR glasses. Uh, okay. Because then you're using sound, positional sound very acutely when you're building an AR or VR world where you can have sound cues. You can also load, he was in, like, he was like, you know, you can tag this, you know, which is my water bottle here with a sound cube, which is on the table. And you can actually have sound playing from it, AKA you can place ads as well. Not saying that Apple will go into that avenue, but the fact that they are mapping that out, and he said Apple has actually gone into an agreement with the NFL, and they're going to record games this fall in the NFL, in you know to give you an AR and 3D view where you can select anywhere on the field, off the field to watch the game. Mm -hmm. So, which is why I don't think it's going to come out this year because they want to develop types of content mm -hmm. because okay. that's the key okay. thing with AR. Fair it's it's not just it's not just games and things like that. You want content for people to go. <gasps> Oh my, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So I wouldn't be surprised they actually do stuff with the Olympics this year as well, just to give, you know, because you now you've got different sports that you can you can play around with as well. Mm. All right, let's see. I mean, it's 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 interesting. I've, I've been to one Dub Dub, um, which was not last year, the year before, and it was, it was awesome. Um, there was a lot going on, lots of demos, uh, lots of creators, but they also had lots of hardware that time as well. Uh, so that always makes things a lot more interesting. So uh, I think we will be getting some hardware this year, uh, but obviously lots of lots of new updates. Uh, we'll be tweeting about the whole thing. Um, so uh, you can uh, follow us on Twitter, SuperSaf and Board at Wag, and you'll be seeing some live tweets whenever the event is uh, going on. Okay, so let's move on to Xiaomi. So Xiaomi have been, I mean, they've been busy this year. They've been coming up with lots of, lots of stuff, right? <laughs> So uh, the, the, the two key devices, we'll start off with the Mi 11 Ultra, okay? Now this is a device with a 6.81 inch AMOLED display, 120 hertz refresh rate, of course, but the, the, the key thing here, which I've not seen on any of the smartphone, is 1700 nits of brightness. So the S21 Ultra has a peak brightness of 1500 nits. The OnePlus 9 Pro, for instance, has a peak brightness of 1300 nits, 1700 nits. That is that is bright, right? Especially for somebody like me who wears sunglasses, so I'll be able to view this in comfort, even on a sunny day when I've got my sunglasses mm -hmm. on. Now, that's not the only display on this device because there's also a rear 1.1 inch AMOLED display. So it's like a small display on this massive camera module. Like this camera module takes up the whole top of the back of uh, the Mi 11 Ultra. Now this is uh, for things like notifications, reminders, and also as a viewfinder for selfies, if you want to use the rear-facing camera for selfies, which is, again, quite interesting. It's uh, It's got a 50 megapixel main camera, f1.12, which is very wide, 48 megapixel ultra-wide camera, 48 megapixel telephoto camera, 
with 10 times optical zoom and E, 120 times digital zoom. So obviously they're trying to take, get a one up on Samsung with the 100X zoom. So they're like, mm -hmm. we're gonna give you 120 times. I'm personally very much not interested in that feature because 100X as we've seen, yeah, it's fine if you wanna see a sign in the distance. Is it something that you're gonna use all the time? Definitely not, okay. And then we've got a 20 megapixel selfie camera. We've got five, uh, we've got a, a pretty big 5,000 milliamp hour battery, 67 watt wired charging, but also 67 watt wireless charging. So I believe this is the first smartphone in the world to support 67 watt wireless charging as well, which is crazy, okay? And yeah. obviously we've got the Qualcomm Snapdragon 888 with 12 gigabytes of RAM, no information on pricing, but April, is when we'll be seeing it and obviously we'll hopefully be getting our hands on it quite soon so okay so first thing okay i'm, I'm the the display looks interesting i'm not sure about this huge camera module i kind of joked on twitter saying do you want a phone with your camera so because it's just like it's taking up so much of real estate and it's a big big camera bump i do like the idea of having a secondary display at the back i quite like that i'm like okay I see some potential there. If I want to take a selfie, but I want to, you know, really um, get the best quality possible, then I can use the, the, the rear display, even though it's small, but it's fine for selfies. Mm -hmm. um, it seems interesting and knowing Xiaomi, they'll probably come in with some competitive pricing. Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be about 11, 1200 uh, for that device. Which, okay. if you think about everything it has, it's actually competitive <laughs> in in a sense. Um, they might even just push it down. They can also do introductory pricing where it becomes like nine ninety nine or something to start. Um, mm. So I think it'll be competitive. What I find interesting though is so here's the thing: is I I, I always battle with the age old uh, digital processing versus optics, and I think Xiaomi is going for brute force. Because I'm not sure how, I mean, even though their, their software has been really good over the years, uh, mm. especially for their Mi devices, I would say the Mi line uh, photos have been really good in terms of software. But I think, honestly, as much as you know, people like Google and even Apple do a lot of software tricks, in my mind, it's, there's, there's only so much you can do that physics plays a role bigger sensor, more light, those kind of things give you just a better raw image. Software tricks then do the rest for you. That's how I always say it, which is why with the Pixel, like with the Pixel 5 last year, I was, I was like, it's cool. It didn't do much for me. It, you know, it, it didn't further the argument of, of what Google was doing because their sensor was also like four years old in a mm. sense. So I think you know this stuff there. the the rare the rare um, 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 OLED is display is it's a solid one. I mean that's one that Board Femme would love because you know she likes to take selfies and she can take selfies with a better camera. That's like that's golden. I don't know how many people will use it um, in in that respect. I think people like us will use it a lot because now we're like okay we can take with a better camera, you know, which is which is fantastic yeah. if you're going to take any shot. As well. Mm. Yeah, we, exactly. So, you know, so I think I think it's something that, you know, it, it's nice to see that they're putting those things in there. But I think overall, the announcements I got from Xiaomi this till this point in this year, because they've released a bunch of devices from January till now, <laughs> uh, is, yeah. is literally to me just says that Xiaomi is like, OK, look, we are going to show you everything we have and you've got options to pick from. And don't forget, I have, to, I have to just mention this, they actually have true air power available coming out with an 80 uh, watt uh, charger. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a concept. We still don't know exactly. Yeah. No, I thought, it was, I thought, it, was, I thought it was announced as in it's coming and it's uh, 80 watt. No, so they showed the concept, I mean, but there wasn't any specifics about what devices would pricing. support oh, okay. it and okay. you know, pricing, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, okay. we, we talked about this on the podcast. You, you've got a worse memory than me. No, 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 no. I mean, I thought <laughs> they just announced it again with, with this device as well. Oh, did they? Okay, maybe I yeah. missed it. Maybe I, I yeah, missed that's, that. Yeah, that's, that's what I meant. I mean, I wasn't it's, sure it's about not the pricing. Be, it's but... not going to be compatible with this though, is it? No. Um, that part, I don't know. No, I don't. it's not going to be compatible with this. It's 67 watt wireless charging though, which is, I mean, that's insane. Uh, obviously, you're going to need a specific charger that's going to be able to output that amount of uh, power but 67 watt charging, which is uh, which is pretty impressive. Now, Xiaomi, obviously, they didn't just stop there. We have now the Xiaomi 
Mi Mix Fold, which is Xiaomi's first foldable device. It's going on the format now. It seems like the foldable format has now been set. We saw these experimentations, but it looks like everybody is going for what Samsung did, which is the inner fold with an outer display. So the Xiaomi Mi Mix Fold has a 6.52 inch Full HD plus 90 Hertz AMOLED cover display. It has an 8.01 inch Quad HD plus foldable inner display, which I believe is one of the largest foldable displays out there. Quad mm -hmm. camera setup, 108 megapixel primary camera, 13 megapixel ultra wide, eight megapixel telephoto with three times zoom optical, 8 megapixel macro camera now the primary sensor is going to have a um it's, it's a new sensor it's called the surge c1 isp and this is supposed to be you know very much improved qualcomm snapdragon 888 12 or 16 gigabytes of lpddr5 ram 256 512 ufs 3.1 storage of course 5020 milliamp hour battery with 67 watt charging and the pricing, I mean, it's going to be coming to China first. So we've got the yuan pricing. We don't have any information about pricing and availability internationally, but 999 yuan is going to be the starting price, which trans, which which kind of converts to approximately 15, 1500 US dollars, right? Now, obviously, it's not going mm -hmm. to be a like for like conversion because of everything else, taxes, etc. But based on what we have right now. So, I mean, the first thing, as I mentioned, it looks like the, the folding format has been set, right? Everybody's kind of now going to the Galaxy Fold format, which is the inner folds with the outer display. So we're gonna see more competition in this area. And Xiaomi, I mean, coming in at that price, I mean, depending on what it retails at, is quite competitive because as we've seen, all the other foldables are more closer to the $2,000 price point. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, sorry, just to quickly summarize back, the Xiaomi Pad will offer 20 watt charging per device with 19 coils coming in at ninety dollars. Sometime soon, no release date yet. Just oh, so it's a pad. You, you're not the true wireless thing. The no, 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 no. Just I'm talking about the 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 air air power pad that you know Apple canceled because they couldn't mm -hmm. make it themselves. Um, okay. But but speaking of the. Uh, uh, Mi Fold, uh, you know, I mean, right now it looks like everything looks like a Galaxy Fold uh, clone, <laughs> you know, <laughs> in respect. Uh, we'll have to see just what it does different and, you know, can bring to the table. And I think with these announcements, definitely going to see an S Pen with a Galaxy Fold 3 this year. Samsung's going to say, no one can do this except us because nobody could do it with the Fold, I mean, with the Note. So I think that's going to be their stamp with this and saying, here you go. How, how do they differentiate? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I think uh, Xiaomi has to show us what's what's going to make their own device different that we go like, oh, OK, this is a different foldable and this is something you can do with this foldable, especially now that everyone's going with the same design design language. Yeah, I mean, I think Xiaomi's always been aggressive on pricing and that's something that really kind of comes across now. Obviously, we've just got the conversion, but if it is coming in at fifteen hundred dollars, that's, you know, uh, almost a quarter of other devices, which kind of then brings it. Because I mean, if you, if you, if you look at say one of the flagship devices, you're looking at around thirteen hundred dollars, right? So it's just like, okay, I want a flagship, but I want the Xiaomi, I want a folding flagship, two hundred dollars more. Fine, that's not bad. Actually, it's 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 the same price as a fully loaded iPhone or a Galaxy S twenty one Ultra, like exactly. full spec. So exactly. So then when you when you're kind of you know in that sort of territory it's kind of like okay now a lot of people can see themselves going you know two thousand dollars kind of seems like it is that ceiling it's like okay that's that's quite a bit more it's like five six hundred dollars more than what i you know would want to spend but when it's like a couple of hundred dollars okay it's it's something that now becomes now this is what the trend that i want to see with foldables right Going ahead, I want to see the foldables kind of come more down in price, which then makes them more accessible and then really kind of shows people how good they are and how, you know, because, you know, a lot of people are still uh, quite, you know, skeptical about them. Uh, me and you love foldables, of course. Yeah. Uh, we have lots of friends that love foldables. Uh, I really do think that there's a lot of potential here. And obviously having this competition here, we've got, you know, right now the big players are Samsung, obviously, Huawei and Xiaomi. If Xiaomi kind of brings this over to the Western market, because the Huawei obviously is is not really uh, coming anywhere else. If Xiaomi start bringing this to 
the, the other markets, it's going to, you know, again, push Samsung to do something hopefully different, but also um, push foldables forward for everybody. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I was going to ask, do you think Samsung will play with the price now for the Galaxy Z Fold 3 or even maybe offer two options? Um uh, just to just to give us that idea that look it's cheaper maybe like sixteen hundred starter without a pen with a pen or oh, some I don't know just options. Like I, I think they will because if we saw the when the when the the fold initial kit the the first fold came out it was like priced very high obviously the fold two even though it was an overall better smartphone in pretty much every way right uh, the display everything was just better right and you know kind of they went. I wouldn't say they went completely back to the drawing board, but they kind of addressed a lot of the feedback that they had, but it was cheaper. And that's just yeah. how obviously things progress that, you know, when you kind of get better at making something. So I do think, yeah, it's going to, it's going to carry on coming down, but I think the settling point, you know, will be around that $1,500 mark. For me, I think that's going to be the settling point for a lot of foldables. Yes. We might see some budget foldables, right? Um, maybe more towards the, thousand twelve hundred dollar but i think the the flagship foldables will kind of settle at the fifteen sixteen hundred dollar price yeah no that makes sense yeah so we'll see now what you might be able to do soon is uh buy some of these devices with paypal using bitcoin or cryptocurrency so uh, i'm not sure that was the best transition but anyway uh paypal is now going to be allowing Bitcoin and crypto spending. So PayPal um, uh, just kind of talked about this uh, a few days ago. Um, and uh, just reading a, a an article here from the BBC, which covers this, PayPal has entered the cryptocurrency market, announcing that its customers will be able to buy and sell Bitcoin and other virtual currencies using their PayPal accounts. Those virtual coins could then be used to buy things from the 26 million sellers which accept PayPal, it said. So that's very interesting. And um, the uh, other cryptocurrencies to be added first will be Ethereum, Litecoin, and Bitcoin Cash, okay? All could be stored directly within the PayPal digital wallet, the company has said. Right, so um, E, you're somebody who's obviously more into the cryptocurrency space what does that mean now paypal i believe this is just us right now by the way okay so it's yeah, only us I'm, right now but what does this mean it's quite interesting though um so it says that you can pay with crypto it doesn't say you can actually buy crypto yet right if i'm not mistaken from the article uh, uh well crypto spending. having a look back yeah because uh, here's the thing uh right now you can buy crypto with paypal but it's right now it's region specific and it's like a I call it like a pilot program at best because I've been a PayPal customer since 1999. I don't have access to that because I was trying to buy some more crypto using PayPal and I couldn't. But also what I do know is that you can buy, but you cannot actually transfer to an auto wallet. So I'm a bit not skeptical. I'm just a little confused in how they're doing things because. So, so it kind of seems ahead. like from what, what I understand is that you'll be able to buy products. So like, okay, you want to buy a Tesla right yeah <laughs> if, if tesla accepted paypal then you could actually use bitcoin to buy that so you could connect it again i'm not sure of exactly how it true would work. we need to try this out except except they haven't mentioned that they will be offering the, you the ability to buy crypto number one because how am i going to move the crypto into that paypal wallet and number two is can I move my crypto away from that wallet to my own private wallet or to another wallet? Like So right now, most people generally will just buy crypto off Coinbase. And Coinbase, you have a wallet within Coinbase, or you can transfer to your private wallet, which is what anybody who does crypto tells you to do, is like get your own personal wallet, because then you now control, that's the whole idea of crypto, you control your currency and you can move it wherever you want to. Uh, and what PayPal has done, from what I know, is you can buy crypto on PayPal in certain regions, and again, it's a small program, which I'm not part of, uh, but I know with that program, you can't move it to a different wallet. So it's almost like they're using that opportunity to now say, now you can spend your crypto. So the from all looks and intents, they want that money to circulate within PayPal, as a whole, 
as opposed mm. to because they haven't mentioned any any way of transferring the money out or things like that. Most likely, when this service starts, they will say, "Hey, you can buy crypto as well," um, which means if I buy the crypto, I'm storing it in my PayPal crypto wallet, and then I'm spending that money on PayPal through PayPal as well, which they're getting a fee from the merchants no matter what because when if you have that PayPal logo it's, on there, it's a smart it's, move it's, from PayPal. It's a and smart I think move. It makes it- it, it makes it a lot more accessible as well because PayPal is something that everybody knows and trusts. Um, we've obviously worked with PayPal many times uh, on, yeah. on, a, on a commercial basis as well. Very good to work with as well. We've been using PayPal personally for, I can't even remember how many years I've had my PayPal accounts, right? Um, yeah. But even like we pretty much use it on a daily basis because it's just the most trusted and easy. I mean, right now, if I want to kind of, you know, send you money, um, it's easy to do the conversion as well. I don't have to kind of Think about it, worry about it. Everything's kind of set. It will give me the conversion rate and everything. It's very, very easy. I've got the smartphone app. My smartphone app, you know, I can assign my um, fingerprint ID or my face ID to it. And, you know, that now combined with uh, the ability to play around with crypto, for me, just makes it so much more accessible. Because even, you know, you mentioned Coinbase, and yeah, you can go into Coinbase, but it's still a little bit confusing. It's like, okay, what do I do here? What well, Now that you've got, it, it, once it becomes part of PayPal, boom, it's mainstream. It's more way more mainstream than it w- would be. Yeah, yeah. I, I think what PayPal needs to do, so to me, the only reason why I'm a bit skeptical is because this sounds like half half measure steps into 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 the crypto space and i think if i were paypal i would be much more aggressive and faster with this because coinbase is going public here in the us very soon and once they do that they legitimize crypto to me what paypal needs to do because paypal has has fought this war of things like venmo cash app you know, younger generations have used that as their way to just keep their money and also pay friends and stuff like that. While people like us have always been using PayPal for years to send money to friends and family. What PayPal needs to do is now connect, you know, they own Venmo now. They also own, they also are PayPal, which is connected with so many businesses. Then you bring in that crypto and then you create a crypto wallet, like a, an offset wallet, which is what Coinbase has, so that people can go, okay, I have my paypal wallet which is also Mm. linked to my paypal account doesn't matter it's cool now i can buy sell crypto and shop at the same time like give people a nice package because to me it just sounds like somebody there really wants to do it as an exec but all the other execs are like ah let's just do a half step in let's let's test the waters out in there so i would like to see that from them but it's a nice nice venture because it means that moving forward then even if even if uh, the merchant doesn't accept crypto, you can still pay with crypto no matter what because mm-hmm. PayPal allows you to do that. It means it will convert the crypto over to cash and then, and then yeah, sell. Yeah, you can pay it. And then everything's kind of in one place. But again, yeah, place. I mean, it's, it's promising. Crypto's becoming very, very serious now. And, you know, it's something um, that people are mo- a lot more confident in than they were maybe a few years ago. And it's I, I think it's definitely you know, here to stay and it's got a lot more potential going forward. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I can't wait for crypto mining on the, on the moon because it's closer to the sun and uh, then we use less energy, but it'd be super cool. <laughs> yeah, let's, uh, let's uh, hope so uh, soon. All right, a uh, final coverage uh, for the podcast this, uh, for this episode. LG, again, moment, another moment of silence E for, for LG. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, we've got an article here on Phone Arena. LG might discontinue software support for existing phones after exiting the market. So LG is expected to conform, for, confirm its exit from the smartphone market in April. And a new leak says that the announcement could come as soon as next week. The Korean company's struggles have been very public. Up to the end of 2020, it had logged 23 straight loss marketing quarters. Quarters. Wow. Um, after initially paying down, playing down reports of withdrawal from the industry, LG admitted in January that it was considering various options, including sale, withdrawal, and downsizing of its mobile unit. Okay, negotiations with potential buyers have reportedly failed, and the company is now preparing to shut the smartphone business. Lika Tron reports that the company will issue a formal statement announcing exit from the smartphone industry on Monday. So that's a 
coming up next week. Remaining employees will apparently be assigned to a home appliance factory. And uh, yeah, it's it's just not looking good for LG. And uh, uh, even though LG will likely commit to continuing OS and security support, it would just it would be just lip service, right? The company is already the slowest when it comes to updates and after withdrawal from the industry, it would have no incentive to roll out updates. Now that's actually another point as well because LG is not known for their software updates, right? You know, we've yeah. we've, we've seen obviously OnePlus, uh, you know, a lot of people talk about their quick software updates, which are questionable recently, uh, but Samsung has really upped their game when it comes to updates and they've also promised longer security updates. Now obviously LG, even if they do exit, they will have to somewhat provide some sort of update service, especially for security updates. But I mean, if they've not got incentive, if they're already bad right now, I mean, how much worse, uh, you know, are they going to be? Yeah, I mean, it's it's quite striking because I almost wanted to say we should add a segment uh, called let SAF and, you know, uh, Board at Work run LG Mobile because we will revamp it <laughs> in nine months. Uh, because a, a, a lot of things they're talking about is I'm looking at, I, I see a company that's not realizing the potential it has and it's looking at its downfalls. And I think one of the things the LG has not done properly is take care of its home base career. Mm-hmm. As a company, they are not sought after in Korea in terms of smartphones. Home appliances, yes, they, I mean, and TVs, they excel in, in that area. And I think one of the things that if I were looking at LG right now is, look, okay, fine. We've got software engineers. We have to downsize. We cut it out and we run stock Android. Call it a day. Mm-hmm. Their job now is just to maintain those update transfers so it matches our, our hardware. That's pretty much it. Go back to simple, clean designs and attack that 300 to 500 dollar budget range and i swear to god the lg name will run supreme right there then higher because at least most users will look at it because here's the thing i just did a video on the poco f3 on my gaming channel snapdragon 870 runs as well as a snapdragon 888 and and cooler by the way Hmm. so if it is running well the problem with that phone is the camera is just busted (laughs) This is called mm-hmm. it's not good it's not good yeah. lg can make a decent camera with the eyes closed that's the funny part they can do that they've, with the eyes closed they've got experience obviously they've yeah. been doing that for a long time and uh, so they, they could so yeah for me it's, it's just one of those things where it's it's sad to see because i think a lot of people have decided let's just cut the loss and go as opposed to let us do something something <laughs> more strategic here Okay, so here's the thing. Uh, I see what you're saying, but I also think it's too little too late because if they've posted 23 quarters in a row of losses, okay, this is something that they should have been doing a couple of years ago. So how much is 23 quarters? Okay. For, uh, that's five, that's over five years, right? Okay. No, no. Uh, oh, yes, quarters. Yeah, quarters. Yeah, that's yeah, over five quarters. years so, of losses. So, so if, if, they've, yeah. if they've been posting, I mean, to me, what you're saying right now you know, which I agree when we've been we've been shouting about for the past five years anyway, right? These are things that should have been done a few years ago. Now, to me, it's kind of like, has the ship already sailed? No, see, I disagree here. And this is something that I actually will, will ping back to Renee. And he always mentions this. He says, the reason why Apple and Samsung can make these phones and make money is because they have other divisions that make more money and eat up those losses. So here's what I think is really good in LG. The home appliance division and the other divisions are literally telling them we do not want to eat your losses anymore. But here's the other aspect to this. We live in a world that is smartphone centric be- not because it, it's the thing we use, it's because it's the most essential thing above our own wallets at this point. Now, we're going into a world, we just mentioned crypto right now, right? You cannot do anything crypto on a home appliance. You're literally cutting out one sector of your, of your future cash basis that might apply to other things itself even the smart home like lg has like the, the whole lg think you smart home thing there's oh, nothing to connect you. it to right thank you I, Mem- I remember the name home. think remember the thing Q came because the home appliance team said you must use that name because we came up with it on the phone 
Crowbarring so, it in. Exactly. So here's to me, it's it's a matter of to me. What I'm seeing now is a company that has a lot of egos and has not understood that. Yes, you have to eat that pain because we are driving those customers to you. Because what happens is those guys remember that yes, I have an LG appliance. Most people don't remember the appliances when they buy them. People remember their phones. I mean, mm-hmm. as much as. LG appliances are huge. The only time you remember is when it's broken, which is usually a a five to six year gap. Like think about it this way. You have something, if you think about the cost of, perfect example, I'm looking at a cooker right in front of me. It costs between $600 to $900. Mm. It lasts for at least six to seven years. Yep. Right? Your cell phone turnaround time is two years. Easy. Yeah. At, at, just, at three to five hundred dollars, I've made more than that at plants if you actually did did it properly. So for me, it's it's just that whole process of I I believe you're right way right now. It feels like it's uh it's a little too late, but I think you know because there is no clear leadership to say mm, no. And also the biggest problem with LG, honest biggest problem which Samsung was lucky to avoid, LG Korea mobile controls LG US. Samsung avoided that when LG, I remember the whole story, I think in Gadget had it, where they said the LG, uh, so Samsung US team said, we make the most money. We are controlling the show. Let's go. That was just <laughs> literally it. You know, they came out and they showed, showed, showed the stats and said, we are driving Samsung and we're helping drive the other Samsung units. And that was it. Done. Mm. You know, and I think that's something that LG didn't focus on, they didn't apply all the, you know, they own WebOS, which now I'm hearing WebOS is going to be showing up in other TVs. But when they bought a WebOS, we didn't see WebOS watches push more. They stopped it. They started with one and they stopped. Till this day, Samsung Tizen watches still come out and they are the best Android watches out there. I mean, people still buy them. It's not like it's, it's a small amount, but people still buy them, you know? So, I mean... Ah, just give me the contract. I'll take it. Okay, yeah. So uh, we'll see. We'll see. LG, we're hopeful for LG, but I, I really do think it might be a little too late. And that's what we have time for in this episode of Super Seth Speaks. Really hope you enjoyed it. Please do leave a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. Check us out on social media, uh, Super Seth Speaks on Twitter and Instagram for updates. And obviously, if you want to see clips, then they are on YouTube at Super Seth Speaks. I'm your host, Saf. And your co-host, Thunder E from Border Work. On Super Saf Speaks, and uh, we'll see you next time.